Welcome everybody online watching, it's great to have you with us today as well and today I'm going to be doing number four in our series called Filled, Filled. Pastor Debbie was uh, say, asking me this morning, do people even see what that is? Do you know what that is? Can you see what that is? Just for her sake, just tell me everybody, what is that thing there? Somebody said sponge and then everybody else said something, what is sponge? Yeah, it's a sponge, eh? It's like filled yes sponge all right okay good okay just um <clears throat> i needed the congregation to stand with me as i win this argument <laughs> today i'm going to talk to you about the holy spirit as our prayer partner the holy spirit as our prayer partner the role that he plays his function in prayer and so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to talk about context. Everybody say context. All right, let me, let me tell you what I mean about context. All right. How many of you know that we all, we all, all believers, there's a verse or two in the Bible we all quote out of context because it just sounds so much better if you can quote it out of context. You can isolate it from the Bible, put it on your fridge, and it doesn't matter that it's out of context. It sounds great. And we just, you know, we repeat the day after day. We don't know what the context is. And sometimes, I must be very honest with you, I don't want to know either. I just want to know what I understand it to mean, right? But we will only discover the truth of God's word when we read it in context, when we understand it in context. And so I'm going to read you a verse from the Bible and if this is one of your favorite verses in Scripture, just give me a loud amen or a wave, all right? Here it comes. Are you ready? Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. If that's one of your favorite verses, come on, just give me a, right? Hey, nice verse, isn't it? Okay. It has context. I'm going to show you context within the verse itself, and then I'm going to take it further and show you that it has context within the passage in which it is written. We're talking about prayer, and I want to show you this. First of all, the context within the verse is this. The verse does not say that I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything that happens to me in life, God will just work it out together because I call myself a Christian, because I come to church on a Sunday, because I claim to be a spirit-filled believer, because I've got it stuck up on my fridge. No, no. The verse says this. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who, two things, love God. There's a relational dynamic not, it doesn't say, for those who come to church, for those who are religious, for those who wear crosses around their necks, for those who wear doves bumper stickers on their cars. It says, for those who are truly in relationship with God. There's a second one. And are called according to his purpose, not our wants, not our whims, not our wills, not our desires, not our anxieties, not our needs, but according to His will, He causes everything to work together, the good and the bad. Can you see the context? Okay. Now, here's another word. Here's another one. I can do all things. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, finish it for me. I can do all things. Whoa, come on. I can start that business. I've got no business plan, but I can do all things, right? 
I'm going to go into debt, but I know my God will come through. I can do all things. I can get into this relationship. I know it's toxic, but, you know, I like her so much. I like him so much. I can do all things. No, that's not what it says. It actually says I can only do, do those things in which Christ strengthens me to do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If the will of God is not in it, then the strength of Christ is not in it, implying then I cannot do it. If I want to insist on doing it, I will be doing it in my own strength. And then most amazing things happen. If it, if it goes pear-shaped, we blame God. You were not true to your word. Okay. Context. Are you with me? Now, let's go back to Romans 8.28. It's a great verse but it has context within a passage in which it is written as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go two verses ahead of 28. I'm going to start at 26. We're going to read that verse in the context in which it is written. Are you ready? And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, Paul says, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. We're going to break this down. And we know, and there it is. And we know, verse 28, that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. What is the context of that verse? Actually, prayer. In fact, it is prayer empowered by the Holy Spirit. That is the context of that verse. And so, I love what Paul does here. He begins to expand on the work of the Holy Spirit specifically in the context of prayer, but this is where he starts. Our weaknesses. Our weaknesses. Nobody likes to start there. I don't know about you, but I don't like to start there. That's why I have a tendency to come before God in prayer with a shopping list. And he goes, I thought we've got relationship. Can we talk about your weakness? No, just answer my prayers. But Paul says, if we're going to talk about this, we have to start in a place of humility. Because that's where repentance started in the first place. When I came before God in repentance, the first thing I needed to acknowledge was that I am a sinner in need of a savior. That I have a weakness that I cannot overcome. It is impossible. And so Paul says here, this is why the Holy Spirit needs to be active in our prayer lives because we have a weakness when it comes to prayer. And, and Paul, when you go and read his letters, he is very open and comfortable with his own weaknesses. And I, I know it was a journey to get there. We are self-centered people. We've got a lot of pride in us. And, and it was the same with the Apostle Paul. You go read the story of his life. A lot of arrogance, a lot of pride. But God humbled him in the process as he walked closer to Jesus every single day. And he got to a place in his life where he was, oh, where he openly said, I am a weak person. In fact, he writes to the Corinthians in his second letter to them. And he tells them about this, this weakness that he carries. He calls it a thorn in his flesh. Nobody really knows what it was. There's some speculation, but nobody knows. And then he, he writes to them and he says to them, I've been asking God to take this weakness from me over and over and over again. And every time I do, he gives me the same answer. This is what he says, 2 Corinthians 12. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. 
So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What is he saying here? He's not saying the minute... I come to terms with my weakness, I begin to get strong. No, he says, when I come to terms with my weakness, I also begin to realize my need for God, for the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And so that's the context of prayer. We're going to break that down. So now that we are clear that a weakness is not a sin, Mm. I can feel the triggers all over. <laughs> a weakness is not a sin. Just like a temptation is not a sin. Jesus never sinned. He was tempted. A weakness is not a sin. How we respond to that weakness has the potential for sin. Paul highlights our weakness in that passage in the context of prayer, Romans chapter 8. And he says this, this is our weakness. Are you ready? Our inability to know what God wants us to pray for. And right now, I, I, I know I, I, can, I can see the brain waves. You're going, but Pastor Jay, of course I know what I want to pray for. I mean, Paul also teaches that I must come to God with prayer, I know what I want to pray for. No, no. Bear with me. We're going to break this down. Okay? Before we do, there's an assumption that Paul here has, a presupposition. He's, he's about to teach the church about prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit. But there's a presupposition to it all. And it's this, that prayer is assumed to be a common discipline in the life of the spirit-filled believer. It was fairly quiet when I started to preach this morning. It's very quiet right now. It is true. When Paul wrote this, it was assumed that prayer, a life of prayer in those who call themselves spiritual believers is a common discipline. It's like brushing your teeth, like breathing. They all pray. In fact, in fact, what Paul is saying is, I want to take you deeper. I'm assuming you're all praying. I want to teach you something deeply spiritual about your prayer life that you might not know. I want to teach you to do this when it comes to prayer. I want to teach you to do that. I'm assuming, however, that you have already mastered this. So maybe we should... Measure, just by the silence in the room, maybe we should just stop here. What do our prayer lives look like? Come on, people are folding their arms. Come on, let, let the Spirit of God speak to you right now. This is not a place of condemnation. Come on, are you okay? You, you, you know that. This is a place of truth. We, ha we have to face up to the truth in the moment. Otherwise, we'll never have the courage to move on. If we can't have the courage to face up to the truth of our lives, we'll never have the courage to take the next step towards the truth that God wants for us. What do our prayer lives look like? It doesn't need to be a standardized, copy-paste, religious formula but it needs to be a discipline in the life of every believer. We need to pray every day. We need to pray. The Spirit makes Himself present in the lives of those who step into the Spirit-filled life disciplines. 
It's like, <laughs> otherwise it's like asking a, person, a, a, a personal trainer to follow you around all day long, but you never exercise. It's a question, you know, he's, at some point he's going to go, why, just tell me again, why am I here? You know, it's like <laughs> saying, say, saying to an athlete, so I, I hear you're quite the athlete. He goes, yes, I used to be. I s mostly watch it on TV these days. Okay, but are, are you you're still an athlete, right? Oh, yeah, but not so much a pra practicing one. We need to pray. Can somebody say amen? I'm getting very uncomfortable here. <laughs> so back to Paul's statement about our weakness. He says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. Okay, let me break that down. In other words, this is what he's saying. He's saying, I live in a physical world. I have real experiences every day. Sometimes I forget that my existence in this world as a spirit being, remember, I'm not a physical being seeking after spiritual experiences. I'm a spirit being living a temporary physical experience. But sometimes I forget that I am that and I am locked in. My thinking, everything about my day is locked into the fact that I live in the confines of my physical experiences, time, space, and matter. And everything I think about every day, including that which I want to pray for, is usually related to things I can see, things I can touch. I know what my needs are, but they are physical needs. I know what I need to pray for in the context of my physical world. In fact, if, if, I, if, if I grow in my spirituality and become more like Christ, I become a little bit more self-centered in my prayers and I become more aware of what other people need and I spend time in intercession for them as well. But I'm aware of their physical needs. They're in pain. They're in hospital. They, they, they need some, some relief of some sort and, and I can express that. This is what Paul says. My weakness is, is that in my understanding of prayer, I'm locked into my own common sense. I can understand the world around me, and so I can understand what I feel I need to ask for, but I do not understand anything beyond my own physical realities. I cannot understand the context of my prayers where in the space where God is, the spirit realm. It's difficult for me to connect the two. Let me give you an example. It's a silly one, but it's an interesting one, I think. At home, we have a dog called Bear. Bear is a cross between a German shepherd and a pit bull. Interesting. He looks quite vicious. He's quite a sweetie. And uh, outside where we sit, he has his own chair because uh, he wants to sit with us when we're outside around the table. And uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a family dog. When, when Bear was young, we trained him to do something very specific. We trained him to, when, whenever he hears the garage door open or the gate open, he runs to the driveway. And we did that for security reasons. We wanted to make sure if we opened our driveway, we live in a suburb, South Africa, <laughs> that there needed to be the presence of this dog that looks really, <clears throat> but it's really like a, like a sweetie, you know, but you know. So what we did was, from a very young age, we've got a, and still to, to, to this day, we've got a packet of biscuits, dog biscuits, in the side door and so every time Bear hears the gate open, he comes running. Not because he's concerned about our safety. No, 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 he's a dog, he's a dog. So let me, let me remind you again, your pet does not love you. He does not love you. Okay, anyway, anyway, you keep believing that. 
You keep believing that he's got the best interest at you as the, all right, I need to move on, all right. Bear comes for one reason only. He comes for that biscuit, right? He doesn't know that he's supposed to check out if there's anybody. He just comes for that biscuit, right? But he's there, and, and that gives us some sort of peace of mind. So he comes, and he takes the biscuit, and he sits right here. The door's open. He sits right there in the door, and he just sits there, and he starts drooling because he knows what's coming. There's a biscuit coming, right? Guess the problem. Every time I give him the biscuit, you can't close the door because he doesn't move away. He's, he eats the biscuit right there, and he takes his time. He drops half of it on the ground, and then he just takes his time and savors the, the flavors, and then he licks up the rest, and now I can't close the door. I can't, I'm scared I'm going to drive over him when I do close the door. So I've had to do something different. I had to take the biscuit and then lure him away from the car. I literally take one leg out of the car, lure him away, let him eat the biscuit over there. And he's always, he's like, you see the look on his face. It's like, what the freak are you doing? <laughs> and now that he's away, I understand. Now I can close the door. And I'm actually doing this for his good. Right? He doesn't get that. He will never get that. I'm a superior being to him. He doesn't understand my reasoning. He doesn't understand my, my, my contextual thinking in a timeline that I need to reverse the car. He doesn't think like that. He's a dog. And even if I could explain it to him, he, will, he doesn't have the capacity to understand that I'm doing certain things for his good. He doesn't get it. If he could reason in that moment, this is what will probably go through his mind. I need a biscuit. You have the biscuit. I am here. Give me the stupid biscuit. What is this? <laughs> let it go. I'm praying for this now for how long? Just let it go. Let me have it. <clears throat> he doesn't know that I'm holding on to the biscuit because I need to reposition him for his own good before I let the biscuit go. And sometimes we pray and we don't understand why God doesn't come through. And he's going, you need to trust me. You see, the only thing that bear has is his trust in me. He needs to trust me. He will never understand it. I cannot explain it to him. He will never get it. But he needs to trust me that in the process of repositioning him, are you getting this? Sometimes God holds on to our prayers because he needs to reposition our attitudes. James says sometimes you pray, but you don't get because your prayers are self-centered. And you pray because of the things you want. You don't understand God's will, but you only ins and you insist that this is my will. And I need God to answer this for me right now. Give me the biscuit. <laughs> Sometimes he needs to reposition the way we face in the right direction of 30 years, in the context of 30 years, 20 years. You see, for us, a prayer is just a prayer right now. It's just a need right now. God says, no, I see your future. I am not a father that, will, that have brat children. I need you to trust me. I have only good in mind for you. The reason why you don't have it yet is because I'm still positioning you. Prayer is letting God know what we want, then trusting him to respond in the way he wants. You see, and this is where the Holy Spirit becomes an exchange agent. <laughs> he's, like, he's, he's like the person who can speak both human and dog. <laughs> he comes in between in that space. You see, if, if I can illustrate it uh, with a little bit of drama. We, 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 we're on our way to the throne room with prayers in hand, right? Assuming that we're spiritual believers and therefore prayer is a normal 
common discipline in our lives. So we're on our way to the throne room, prayer in hand. And suddenly the Holy Spirit appears and he says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to the throne room. I've got my prayers in my hand. God said, I must pray. He says, that's great. Won't you hand them over to me? No. We don't like middlemen. No, 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 no. Middlemen, oh my word, they slow down the process. No, 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 I'm taking my prayer to the throne room. I want it answered right now. So Holy Spirit says, no, no, you need to trust me. You need to trust me. If you don't trust me in this, you're going to get frustrated. You need to hand your prayer over to me. I'm going to take it to God. And I, because I understand your heart and your desires. You see, he's the spirit of Christ. Who understands what it means to be a man and a woman. A human being. He's seated at the right hand of God. Interceding on our behalf. You see, that's the work of the Spirit. He says, give me your prayers. Well, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to translate them into the will of God. Why? Because you don't know what to say by the time you get to the... You're going to get to the throne room and you will be so overwhelmed. You will just go... See, I get this. Give it to me. That also means you need to be patient. But I promise you this. If you, if you allow me into your prayer life, if you allow me to bring context, you see, we don't want that. I just want to know. I just want to know. You know what? And then, oh my word, we make it so religious, right? We don't, we don't want the Holy Spirit. We've got this. You just, you know, you just, you, you, you pray your prayer. And at, the end, and at the end of the prayer, you do a shadadadabadadada sana shandai. And then it's like, it's like a stamp on that prayer, you know? It's like a, like a douche, douche. God says, oh my word, that is so spiritual. I have to deal with this immediately. <laughs> Ooh, and we shake and we... Uh, 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 and God says, that is so holy. Oh my word, I'm so drawn to... No, the Holy Spirit says, Relax. You're being pretentious, religious. You're actually self-centered. What are you doing? Drawing attention to yourself. Hand your prayers to me. <clears throat> and then he comes back, you see. And he says, I've got the answer. The answer is, can we talk about your weaknesses? I need money now. I want to talk about my weakness now I'm repositioning your thoughts yes but this is for, yeah, you need to trust me you need to trust me I promise you when we're done when we're done the answer you're gonna get back will blow your mind in fact this is my promise it will be exceedingly abundantly more than what you can ever wish or think or imagine or ask for. But you have to trust me. I, I think I told you this story before. One of my sons, when they were in school, came to me one day, said to me, so they, they lived... A like a middle class life. They got grew up, they, they grew up in kind of, you know, middle class family. But God gave them the grace to go to private school, which was an incredible blessing for us. But now they've got private school friends. <laughs> it's tension. This is tension. So the one comes to me one day. If, if you heard the story before, please forgive me. I think it's a good example. One comes to me, he says to me, Dad, I need shoes. I say, what do you want? He says, I need Adidas Ultra Boosts. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, don't worry. It's too expensive to even think about. <laughs> I said to him, uh, how much are these things? At the time, back then, it was two and a half thousand rand. I said to him, I'm not buying you that. There's no ways. For shoes. No. No. I said to him, I don't have the money. And by the way, just 
for the record, even if I had the money, I'm not buying you those shoes. It's not necessary. So he gets grumpy. Why? Because his dad isn't giving him what he wants. Come on, just let the Holy Spirit speak to you now. He gets grumpy. Because he wants what he wants. You own a cattle on a thousand hills. Why can't I have Adidas Ultra Boost? <laughs> so then he's grumpy. He comes back a week later. He goes, okay, how about we go 50-50? I said to him, no, I'm not giving you one cent. Now he's even more grumpy. Listen, yeah, this is good parenting. Some of you are getting very anxious right now. I mean, you're taking tissues out and like, like, how can he do that to his kids? I mean, it's just, oh, oh my word, I'm getting anxious right now. I'm getting a panic attack. It's like he's parenting. Oh my word. No, no, just chill. That's good parenting. He comes back. So one day he's, I called him. I went, knocked on his room, said to him, you know, you know, but yeah, I have little things in between. He runs to his room, slams the door. So you've got to knock on the door, open the door, say, just a quick thing. That's my door. You slam it again. I'm going to take it off. <laughs> I, just, I just thought you, one, you should know that. And that too is good parenting. By the way, don't make those promises if you're not prepared to keep them. Uh, if you do that again, I'm going to kill you. No, that's not you. Don't say that, don't you? You're not going to keep that promise. You can't keep that promise. He, they know you will not keep every other promise that you make, no matter how high the volume of your voice goes. So I said, can I talk to you about your shoes? And his whole face lights up. Oh, you see, this is what you do. You just manipulate them emotionally, and eventually they give in. I said, no, I'm still not buying your shoes. He's like, so what are you doing here? I said, I want to talk to you about your shoes. Do you really want those shoes? Yes. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, what do you mean? I said to him, this might surprise you, but if you really want those shoes, I'm not going to buy them for you, but if you really want them, I, I'm, I'm with you. Go get them. Well, must I steal them? No. <laughs> no. Let me teach you the hustle of life. Do it legally, do it morally, but let me teach you the mysteries of the hustle of life. And from that moment, we, I began to teach him how to generate his own income and not be dependent on his dad's pocket money. Fast forward a couple of months, maybe a couple of years later. Walk into his room. He says, Dad, come check this. Opens a shoebox. Adidas. How did you do that? Tells me how I did this. I went and bought some stuff there, sold it to my friends, made some profit. I, I hustled, I hustled, saved the money. I got my shoes. A couple of years later or months later, I don't know what the timeline is. He came to me, he said to me, I want to give you something. I said, what do you want to give me? He says, I want to give you these. <laughs> do you know what these are? They're called Yeezys. You think I bought these? No, 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 no. I cannot afford these. My son gave them to me. What happened? His dad said no, but he got it anyway. In the process, he got exceedingly, abundantly more because he learned some lessons. He broke out of some weaknesses some insecurities, some entitlement. His prayers were answered, but not in the way that he thought. You see, that's what the Spirit of God does with our prayers. And I love the way Paul describes it. He says, in verse 26, he says, the Spirit prays with us with groanings. Groanings that cannot be expressed. 
I went and, and did a word study on that because I wanted to get my head around that and I, nobody really knows what that means. But the best English way to describe what Paul is saying there, and it's difficult to, to write it down in words, and that's why he uses that phrase. He, he prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. The, the Greek word that Paul uses there relates to a deep sigh, like, not only is it a clear indication of the personality of the Holy Spirit, because something impersonal cannot do that, but it, it, it creates this picture in my mind, have you ever had a, a deep, important conversation with somebody and you're both sitting down and whether it's a good conversation or a bad one you know you're 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 about to propose or you you're about to tell somebody that they fired or you know it it could be both but both of you are sitting down and the person who needs to speaks first looks the other person straight in the eye and goes can you feel it what do you know? There's something deep, authentic coming. And it's for me, what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a sign. It, it, it's like a, it, it fills me with hope and faith that allows me to believe that God is a God who is deeply determined and fully committed to do whatever it takes on his part to cause everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. See, when we trust God in prayer about anything, he's committed to take care of everything. Way beyond our understanding of the context of this one prayer need I have. But I have to trust him. One of the most difficult prayers that people pray is healing for those loved ones around them who are dying. And they pray and they pray, Lord, heal them. Heal them. Heal them, please, Lord. Heal them. And one of the most difficult conversations I have with people like that is this. Do you trust God? Yes. Do you trust God that He heals people? Yes. So let's pray. Not wishy washy prayers. Not round the bush prayers. You know what I'm talking about? Let's ask him. Let's ask him, Lord, can you, will you heal me? Will you heal somebody in my life that's dear to me? Will you heal them? I want to see them get out of that bed, get out of hospital and, and walk and do whatever they need to do. Will you heal them? God says, I hear your prayer. But you, you are unable to ask me I need you, need you to understand your weakness. Your weakness is you are unable to ask me with a full understanding of my heart and my mind and my love and my care for both you and this person you're praying for. So here's a question I need to ask you. Do you trust me? Yes. So I want to point out another weakness. Before I answer your prayer, I want to point out another weakness. That deep inside your soul, there, there, there might be a, a motive for you wanting that person to live. It's not because they need more life, but you do not want to go through the pain of seeing them go. I don't want you, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to have that discussion. But what if it's true? And so sometimes we see our loved ones walk out of the hospital completely healed from the most horrendous diseases and we worship God. 
And other times we don't. And then we go back to God and say, why did you do this? Say, why did I do what? I asked you to heal them. God says, but I did. I did. They are in pain no longer. They are in my presence. Now let's talk about your pain. Your pain of grief. Because I want to be here for you too. So the spirit comes and he sighs. So can we take a moment to pray? This is what we're going to do just for five minutes. This is what we're going to do. If you want to pray in, in a small group around you, no more than three or four people, just around you where you sit, that's fine. If you want to pray with just you and your family or you and your spouse, you can do that. Or if you just want to be left alone, you just want to pray by yourself, you can do that too. But this is what I want you to do in just a moment. I want you to just close your eyes and think about what it is that you need to ask God for. Be bold. Be bold. Don't worry about the devil on the side. You're condemning you. You don't have a right to pray. Do you know what you did this week? Do you think he wants to talk to you? No, 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 no. Don't. God is right here and he is present. Remember we said about this? The Holy Spirit is is comfortable walking uh, and hovering, hovering in dark spaces. He's comfortable there. He's comfortable in your space right now. Don't worry about that. But just before you begin to, to ask him in your own words, just from your heart, or you pray for each other, or you pray for yourself, just take a deep sigh and just go, <sighs> breathe out the anxiety, breathe out the fear. Breathe out, breathe out the, your, your, your own self-centered ideas of what this should look like in the end. Just breathe the breath of absolute surrender. And then begin to pray. Let's see what God does. Do that right now. Holy Spirit, in this moment, we want to do what Paul did. And as we just allow ourselves to be in this moment, this God moment, we want to do what your word tells us to do as we walk into the most holy place, is to go past the altar where our weaknesses are exposed where we cannot, we are reminded that we cannot afford 
to ignore the fact that we are human beings saved by grace on a journey of perfection, but not there yet. And our weakness, Lord, requires repentance. We confess today that we have neglected this deep relational discipline. We've neglected prayer in our lives. We don't pray anymore. We don't pray with our families. We don't pray with our spouses. We don't ask for your guidance in the beginning of the day anymore. We don't stop to thank you at the end of it any longer. We're just so overwhelmed and tired, and busy and rushing. But we need you, Lord. We need you to bring life life, abundant life, back into our prayers to make us hungry again for the presence of God. And then teach us to trust. Lord, we repent that at some stage we've been disappointed and we've almost said, what? Why bother? We want to return to you. We want to return to a place of trust in that which is in the Spirit and let go of our common sense in that which is in the physical. But to trust you. Fill us, Lord. Fill us. As we breathe out that which we need to let go of. We breathe in your peace, your love, your truth. We recommit ourselves to you this day. Forgive us our sins. Fill us with your spirit. Renew us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.